I don't know. I, I haven't heard someone ask him that. Have you asked him that? Ask him if he writes it down. Good. I never, ever write material down. <laughs> Uh, because if I do, it's not very good. It's it's uh, it's good for talk shows and after dinner or something, but it doesn't make it for the stage. It, it's got a weakness in it that, that the, my other stuff doesn't. The, the stuff I just make up has a, has a sort of ballsy edge to it. Little needs to be said about Billy Connolly. He belongs on the Mount Rushmore of comedy, blazing a trail in the UK which almost every comedian has followed. He's as Scottish as a Highland cow skimming stones with the Loch Ness Monster, has a voice that could give Morgan Freeman a run for his money, and a presence that can delight the weariest of souls. And the door opened and he looked out and smiled and, and the hair flopped like that and I thought, Jesus, I fancy him myself. <laughs> In a career filled with joy and wonder, the thing that defined Connolly and what makes him such a fascinating comedian to watch was how he more or less made everything up as he went along. Mess not with the furry tail clan, defenders of the good, crusaders of the righteous, guardians of the pine. Keep your tree. Connolly's transition from self-confessed hippie folk singer to comedian is a telling one. He got his start in the folk rock band The Humble Bumps with future icon Jerry Rafferty, but found there was plenty of time to talk between each song. In those days you did two 20-minute spots, sometimes two 40-minute spots. So there was loads of time to talk, and the more you talked, the less songs you had to do. So I would blether away. The light bulb didn't come until he forgot the words to the song St. Brendan's Isle in the middle of a performance. I was making a kind of fool of it and I was so nervous that it just blanked after about a verse and a half. And I said to them, oh listen, I've, I've, I've forgotten the words. And there was a kind of titter in the audience. So I said, but what I remember of, of, of the song is, and I started to tell them the story of the song. I was just trying to survive. I said, so the guy finds an island and he gets off his boat and steps on it. And then he realises his island is sailing along. And by this time, <laughs> they're, they're roaring. They can't believe it, you know. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, you got it. I like the sound of that. Yeah. Connolly has taken this process and run with it, taking the seed of an idea and allowing it to grow on stage. So I go on with a small thing and add to it the following night and subtract and add as the nights go on and it becomes a story. I write backwards. So I, I start with nothing and end up with a story. The Crucifixion, a kind of Glaswegian riff on The Last Supper, started by hearing a joke, then adding to it night after night. The crucifixion, the Last Supper, mm. was a joke. There was a guy, Tommy Quinn, and he came up to me one day at a folk club and he said, the disciples were all sitting at the table and they were eating Chinese takeaway. And Jesus came in and said, where did you get that? And he said, Judas bought them, he's come into some money. And I went on the following night to tell it and I added something to it. And the following night I added something else and subtracted something, and it became huge. It became about 25 minutes long. The door opens, <laughs> and then he comes, a big and, hello there, boys! <laughs> With a long dress and the casual sandals. <laughs> comes up and says, hello there, lads, and how are you getting on and that, no? And the wee apostle come up and says, I thought you weren't coming like big and no. I thought you weren't going to turn up. And say, I nearly wasn't he turning up, sonny boy. <laughs> Out all morning, Danny Miracles, I'm knackered. <laughs> He's a glass of that wine. Connolly cannot write jokes, he doesn't know how, but what he can do is form them instinctively in the moment. And that means he can perform entire shows with nothing other than a few words scribbled on a piece of paper. I don't know how to write. I, I'm insanely jealous of people who can write. So you could go out for a two hour, sometimes three hour gig yes. without without literally without an act, but with a, a sort of shopping list of topics That's in, right. in your brain. Yeah. 
and stories around that that you that you fleshed out that you wrote down once or, or no, not? No, I never wrote them down. Nothing ever. Never. Incredible, Billy. Was, I, th I thought that's what everybody was doing. <laughs> You would go on with just eight words. Yes. And from those eight words, you would spin a set. Yeah. I wouldn't think out my act, but I would try and think of what I was going to say the first time they heard my voice. I would try and get that down. Sometimes it wouldn't come. Other, most of the time it came. And then it just flowed on from there. They, they and me together. You can even occasionally see him glance at his notes for inspiration. The piercing of the clitoris is pretty fucking special, don't you think? Can you imagine being down there and somebody's got fucking wind chimes hanging? So, so, it had been. It actually reminds me of something Robin Williams said. Because I don't have an act per se, but more kind of a cesspool of consciousness. So that's a weird. It's that old thing of like, okay, how the fuck do you do this? Okay, just, you know, ideas. Both were elastic, incredibly physical performers, capable of bursting into riffs and characters at the drop of a hat. Unsurprisingly, the two were close friends. Williams even attended Connolly's breakthrough performance for American audiences. Oh, when guys have been shot, you know, when you get shot, they put sticky tape around your body. <laughs> We'll have that shape on the street. Joe Bananas, oh, fucking great. On hairdresser's floor for that. Where most comedians have a set list they will move through one step at a time, Connolly, like Williams, believed in something more fluid. Instead of performing a set in a linear direction, they have a membrane of ideas they can jump between and move around. And you need a good brain for comedy. You need to... Everything you say should have five or six alternatives behind it. So this stuff goes round, and I, to explain it to you, it's, it's choosing what to talk about. Like you, it comes by like that, and the merry-go-round in a park is the best way to describe it. It's funny watching Connolly when he's performing with a stationary mic because he can't keep still enough to speak into it directly. Instead, he kind of bounces around it, each new idea taking control of his body as if he were being possessed by a series of hyperactive pogo sticks. And these big shiny people, they run that, that confident way. <laughs> you know, when they come out at the beginning, they do all that. We come out, we run like that. <laughs> what the fuck's that? Instead of the precision you get from a comedian like George Carlin, where every word has a specific place and purpose, Connolly's approach is completely uninhibited. There's never a sense that Connolly is going through the motions when he's performing because he simply doesn't have that option. He's scrambling and rediscovering the jokes and stories as he tells them. The, the guy came to the fork in the road. He, and he's talking to his conductor. Hey, fucking, run around and bring him in here. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> he whacks it round to the right. The thing's on two wheels. Oh, Jesus! And I looked up and she was gone. This also means he never loses the rambling charm of real conversation. If you give the ball to me, I'll give it to him. He can give it to him. And he can maybe give to, maybe Alec, do you want the ball? Ah, well, okay, he'll give you. After I give it to him, he gives it. You'll fucking give it, do you? Oh, fuck I. Oh, yes. Overall, you get an authenticity that simply wouldn't come across if he had written it down. Isabel. Hello. So, hello, Isabel. How are you doing? Great. Would you like to dance? Hey, 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 hey. Come on. I'm all right, Isabel. Right, fine. And it's the gay Gordon's day. And the guys are all going, Whoa! Shut the fuck up! <laughs> 
Obviously, this looseness means Connolly's shows have little structure, and he often goes on tangents even he doesn't remember the reason for. Will I tell you something? This <laughs> I will be telling you several things as the night <laughs> as the night wears merrily forward. But I've got a lot to say, and uh, and it comes out kind of. Sometimes it comes out kind of in the wrong order. Please, please don't worry about this. I personally couldn't give a fuck. So, so don't, don't let it get you down. It's not uncommon to hear him say things like, Why am I telling you these things? What am I fucking talking about? Oh yes! So now, but anyway, I was in Dunedin in my room. Oh, fuck, I must tell you this before I tell you about that, but it was the same room, so it won't take too long to set up. There's even a story of a fan that followed Billy around to multiple shows, waiting for the end of a story about a guy in a toilet that never came. And Connolly blames this habit on a slightly disjointed memory. I've got this weird kind of memory thing that I don't, I don't hold information for very long. But when I go out and talk about it, it all comes back. But sometimes it doesn't come back in order. You know, this kind of memory dyslexia. Aye, so it comes back, <laughs> but which makes it much more interesting. It's like somebody giving you a big pile of letters, like a mountain on a table, and saying, "Well, that's the Bible," but you could put it together yourself. So did I. Right. Yeah. For Connolly, the joy and chaos of discovery, of seeing where his mind would take him, was its own reward. The the thing about you on stage is that you always looked as if. You're just responding, you're not thinking too much. That's right. Just letting the ideas come in behind one another. And how did you know that you could trust those ideas? You don't know, that's the joy of it. You just speak your mind. And then you'll get a little hint in one of the lines of where you should go next. It's dangerous along this way. So you go along that way and let it happen. And it's always worthwhile. Billy's extraordinary technique. He can leave the subject for days on end, weeks, and always unerringly comes back to exactly where he left off. No, I don't. I sometimes just leave the whole thing and don't refer to it again for years. There's something alive about watching Connolly, a sparkling unpredictability. Time and again he'll abandon whatever he was talking about in pursuit of an idea that's just occurred to him. Here, for example, he's talking about getting a prostate exam before getting gloriously sidetracked. Note also how he looks like he's just been cast as Moses in a biblical epic. Feels fine, Bill. That's okay. You're in good shape. Thanks a lot. Bang, and we go home. At first it was awful. Now it's fair enough. But I got very... <laughs> No, I sent them flowers. <laughs> Can't wait to see you again. <laughs> Time drags between these appointments. Bye. <laughs> However, this unpredictability works both ways. Because Connolly has virtually no filter on what he's saying, he reveals much more about himself than a more measured comedian. He's he's very battle scarred man. He he's he had an appalling childhood, a very abusive childhood, and and he, you know, he brings those scars to his his current life. You know, your act's based on telling about your childhood. And I've told them my whole life. Everything you, except, except Pamela doesn't know the half. <laughs> There's a ruthlessness to his comedy, a shameless quality that is rare even among comedians. It's weird, you know, I've got this mark on me that says nothing. <laughs> Have you had enough? <laughs> what a stupid question. <laughs> Would you like some more of the same? I think you're supposed to say... Would a kick in the testicles be out of the question? <laughs> I don't think I've seen a comedian with so little concern for self-preservation, topics most comedians wouldn't go near, particularly concerning his relationship with his father, are latched onto and attacked. Here, for example, listen to how he pushes through the tension to discover the laugh underneath. And uh, he, he died of a stroke. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, it was uh, his eighth stroke. He was like an oak tree. And God kept trying to kill him, but he wouldn't fucking go. <laughs> Scottish, you know, is that the fucking best you can do? <laughs> Half his body didn't he work, he signed himself out of the hospital, like, come on with that. There's even a prior-esque rhythm to some of his routines. Right, and I'd always try to get out of ass whooping, right, by going to sleep early. You know, get in bed, just go to sleep, pass up supper and shit, no good. My grandmother would wake my ass up, you know, get your ass out, put your hand, put your, don't you run from me, don't you run from me. As long as you black, don't you run from me. Grab my wrist, held me up. The way the angler holds the fish up for the photograph. And I was bent like that. Trying to get my arse as far away from his hand as I could. And he would swing at me. That's a thing they do in Scotland. They hit you in the rhythm of the argument. Don't you ever let me see you doing that again. Connolly brought everything to the audience, and his lack of preparation gave them something uncensored and at times uncomfortably honest. His comedy survived on the courage of the moment, and sometimes, even for him, it was too much. And he'd go up and he'd whack me, you know. <laughs> now take the bloody picture, right? And, go back. <laughs> and I would, and I would start, I would cry. I, I would explain to the audience that I used to, I did that yodeling crying. You know that the, you, you've probably had children, or maybe you've done it yourself. You know, <laughs> what's wrong with you? <laughs> what the hell's that? What are you saying? <laughs> well, I was doing it one night and I burst into tears. Really? Aye, it was, I was too close. Yeah. I was doing it too, too well. On the edge of reality. I had forgotten to step back a wee bit. Yeah, yeah. You must always be, it's like singing the blues. You should be doing it from the outside looking in. Yeah. You shouldn't be in there. Yes. Inflicting everybody with this. It's funny to think a lot of Connolly's most loved routines were literally invented in the moment. Or maybe it makes perfect sense. Connolly has since announced his retirement from stand-up and you can see why. For him, comedy wasn't something you could prepare. It came upon him, possessed him, then abandoned him when the curtains closed. It's worth noting, Connolly wasn't so much interested in comedy as he was conversation. He wanted that feeling of being huddled in the back of a pub, cracking banter late into the night while chaos ensued all around. And you would go home and watch television and a comedian would come on and he'd crack a few jokes and you go, ah, he's okay, he's quite good, that was very good, but you're not laughing. They were roaring, the ordinary guys. I always wanted to capture that thing. The guys at the football match who say something funny to total strangers and they all burst out laughing. And I was after that, that kind of communication. In many ways, Connolly never left his folk singing roots. He knew that the best stories take time to tell, and the things that happen in the moment often last longest in the memory. In a world where so much of comedy is condensed into sound bites and punchlines per minute, one wonders if we offer comedians now the same freedom to experiment and play. One wonders what form a comedian like Connolly would take, or if he would survive at all. Perhaps he is the last of a dying breed, a storyteller traveling between campfires on a never-ending journey to be windswept and interesting. So at the beginning of the show, he's been panicking and said, what on earth am I going to tell people tonight? And I've got in a panic because I think he's going to die. And then he goes out there and he comes up with stuff that I, I know he's, has just immediately been invented because it's about something that we did that week. You won't do nothing, just start your say, darling, say. 
It seems like anything that he sees, he can talk about and, and incorporate, you know? It's a, that's the beauty of it. I think it's like he's like on total... Maybe that's where we're similar. He just sees stuff and it's all processed and it comes out at whenever time he needs it. I think that's where we're both kind of absorbent in that way. I'll buy you a house by the big oak tree, say darling, say. It's very frightening because I'm supposed to be a comedian and but I, I very rarely get funny ideas, you know, for the stage. Uh, they come when I'm there. So I take what I've got onto the stage and then apply what's happening to me at that moment to what I've got. And, but it always, just before it seems as if it's not there. Ladies and gentlemen, Billy Connolly goes... Oh, thank God it's here again. But before, before that, there's not, I mean, I can have months off and not get a single idea.